I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Kemp Powers, the director of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, uh, as part of our Meet the Experts film animation panel. Um, you know, first thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, you know, um, you're coming on to this project uh, uh, after as, after it's after it had such a well-established first entry. What's it like to come into something uh, starting with the sequel? Yeah, I mean, it's daunting, and I'll be perfectly honest, but it's also there's something exciting about it. You have to understand that, like, when Phil Lord and Chris Miller um, asked me to join the team alongside directors Joaquin Dos Santos and Justin K. Thompson, they pitched their idea for the entire film to me. Uh, of course, as you're making any animated film, the story is getting changed and rewritten, but, but the rough idea of the film was pitched to me. And what excited me so much about the idea was just how different it was from the first film. I think the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse for me was a masterpiece. And I think it would behoove me not to even try to follow that up, but just try to do something completely different. And the fact that we were trying to create our own standalone film, um, just evolving characters that were introduced in that film it felt like a better attitude to have going into it than 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 a traditional sequel. I, I know it's like it is a sequel, but it's really hard for me to wrap my head around the idea of calling our film a sequel because it didn't feel like we were making a sequel when we were making it. It felt like we were doing, you know, we were given some characters that have been in an incredible movie we'd all loved and we were telling a completely different story with those characters. And I think that freed us up a little bit um, and took away a bit of the stress. But at the same time, you know, Miles Morales, there's a whole generation of young people who for them, my son included, um, Miles Morales is their default Spider-Man. Um, and he's meant so much to a whole generation. He's meant so much to me. Um, and if anything, I, it's more just like having friends of calling me and saying, hey dude, just do not mess up Miles Morales. Like they love him and their kids, love this character so, so very much that it was more like a personal responsibility to my friends and my children and my friends' children for this character that was kind of like their everything. You just want to, you just want to handle it with, um, not with kid gloves, but you, you just want to handle it with the care and the thoughtfulness that you've, I, I, we all felt like this character deserved. You were mentioning how, uh, you uh how there was some pressure that was taken off but how much you love how much you personally loved uh the uh, uh into the spider verse uh but also getting um you know these messages from people about you know don't screw this up and um i'm, I'm curious which was the big which was the bigger uh thing of pressure on you was it your internal thing about how you viewed uh into the spider verse and you know making a follow-up to that or was it the uh, pressure from other people uh it's, it wasn't the pressure from other people. The biggest pressure I ever have is the internal pressure I put on myself. Um, and that's just like as a filmmaker, as, as a storyteller, um, you know, um, I just wrapped up uh, another film, Soul, um, that, that did, you know, fairly, you know, really well and seemed to really draw in an audience. And just as an artist and as a filmmaker, you want to keep on challenging yourself and um, showing people that like you you have a strong voice and that voice can connect to people so there's no pressure that anyone in the world could put on me that exceeds the pressure that i put on myself every day and it's just a, a pressure to keep doing the things that i've been doing which are just like chasing stories that i'm passionate about and kind of like shutting the world out and just caring about the 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 story because i at the end of the day all of us um i think all filmmakers we are fans you know, we, we are consumers of this thing that we make. And I'm just trying to make something that I'd like to see. <laughs> it really is as simple as that. I'm trying to make something that if I had nothing to do with it, I'd be willing to go and buy a ticket and go out to a movie theater and, and see that thing. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty high bar to, bar to cross for myself these days. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the design of... Uh, this movie, uh, I mean, even going back to the first one, but this one has its own incredible design challenges. And I'm curious as to what was the toughest part of the movie uh, to make from the design perspective of trying to design the look of the of where you were in that. In that I don't part. know if there was any one toughest part, because 
honestly, this film was like, from a production design standpoint, it was like making five movies at the same time. Each world that we created had its own unique design challenges. Um, I can't even call Miles's world, which was present in the first film, as necessarily easy because we kind of rebuilt that and redesigned it from the ground up. Even Miles's home world looks different in our film than it does in the first one. I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, Mumbatan, I would say, is definitely a massive design challenge because the concept for that world, that's when we go to the world of Pavitra, um, Spider -Man, known as Spider-Man India. Um, it was inspired by um, Indian Indrajal comic books, um, which have a very, very distinct look. And it was something we were all a fan of, but bringing that world to life, having it in motion was its own set of unique challenges. But then the other thing we had to think of was that we had um, three original characters from different universes who had to spend about 15 minutes of the film in that world, which is Miles, Gwen, and of course, Spider-Punk, who was you know, one of the most dynamic, striking, you know, jarring looking characters we had in the whole film. So to have those three characters exist alongside Pav in the world of Mumbatan, I think put um, the folks at Sony Pictures, Image Works, um, the, the, our visual development team, I, I think it really was a challenge that like, you know, it, it, put the, it put them to the test. But equally, Gwen's world, the, the world that we open on, the idea of this living kind of like mood ring um, where the entire world reacts to the state of her emotions specifically, but also the um, every character you see their emotions reflected in that world. That was a really cool, easy to get idea conceptually that in practice, um, you know, it had its certain challenges and, and also knowing that we were gonna open the film in this world. It's so strikingly different than anything that had been seen in the first film that for a while we even had little debates about like, should we be opening the film in this world because the visual language is so different and we all agreed that you know what considering the how, how strikingly different so much of it is it's better to just introduce the audience to our film with one of the most extremely different looking universes in our entire film just to kind of get them used to the idea that you're going to be seeing a, a very different visual language in this film than you did in um into the spider-verse um i'm i'm very curious about this. Do you have a personal favorite alternate universe version of Spider-Man? Hmm. I mean, for personal reasons, I'd say I'd say Spider-Punk was was definitely like a big. It really felt good to have Spider-Punk show up in this film. He was a character that a lot of folks didn't know anything about, um, and he was a new character to our film. Um, Daniel Kaluuya is an amazing actor. Um, and his look was one of the most challenging looks to uh, land in the entire movie. And he's also pivotal to Miles' story. He's pivotal to both Miles and Gwen in the film. So I, I think that was a character that had to earn his way. It was hardest to, for this character to earn his way into the film because there were so many different characters, which made it, I think, the most satisfying to not only have him end up in the film but but be a part of the film that connected so much to other people but it's really hard to pick a favorite I mean my favorite is always going to be Miles Morales I'm I'm so enthralled by his story and the arc of this character and and feel like it was so great to have an opportunity to move to this like next step in his evolution as a young man you know to to get to that from that little adolescent to that teen who's like thinking about college and you know as a parent myself just remembering all of the the conversations um, I had with my with my own kids, and, and and there was something about visiting Miles at this point in his life that really really excited me. Um, but again, I could I could say I, I could go on and on about every single major character in this film, and they all feel incredibly personal. You know, Gwen twenty ninety nine. You know, Jess Drew, Pav. Like they they all they all have like they all feel so like special and personal to me. Um, I, what's the biggest difference in directing this style of animation as opposed to uh, versus the type you were directing uh, when you uh, when you worked on Soul? Um, there's really no difference in terms of it's it's to directing in terms of like directing animation for this film versus directing Soul. The major difference is just the the, the number of collaborators. You know, we had three directors on this, um, as well as Phil and Chris. You know, being very very involved in the process. Whereas Soul, you know, it was directed by Pete Doctor and co-directed by my by myself. So, you know, animation is 
is a collaborative medium. I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're, we're having this conversation today, we're doing a panel with animation directors, but at the end of the day, more so, I think even more so than, an, than live action, when you're looking at an animated film, you really are seeing the, the collective energy of a lot, like in our case, a thousand individual artists. You know, and as an animation director, I sometimes am trying to describe the, the, the job to people outside of the business in general. I kind of describe it almost as like air traffic control, you know, because at times it, it is that you have th these really personal things you're trying to inject, but you're also trying to um, take in, um, you know, process these amazing ideas that are coming at you from all different kinds of directions from, you know, your department heads um, in many cases are, you know, fabulous artists in their own right. So I think the job is very similar in that way in that both working on soul and working on this, you know, it's, 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 it's incredibly collaborative. It's almost kind of like air traffic control. The only real difference are the collaborators and, you know, take swap out Pete Doctor and Mike Jones and Trevor Jimenez and some of the wonderful people I worked at, um, you know, work with at Pixar with, with, you know, Phil Lord, Chris Miller, Joaquin, Justin, Mike Lasker, our effects supervisor, you know, Patrick O'Keefe, our production designer, you, you know, Alan Hawkins, our animation lead and Dave Callahan, our writer. And just, you know, it's just the names and people change, but it's, but it's very similar. Well, uh, Ken, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on our panel in just a little bit. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.